as we seek to do these five purposes of the church. We said that at the end of these 30 days, we want to have a transformation in our thinking about the church. Not just viewing it as a place to come to, but as a vibrant family to belong to. A community of believers. We want to become the church. We want to be the church. A church that is a community of faith that's powerful, inspirational, transformational, and most of all, irresistible. Uh, touching the community, touching our community, touching the world with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unlike any organization on the planet that can possibly do, we can do that with the power of the church. That, the power of the gospel, that is the vision of our church. We each received a 30-day church challenge coin like the military use. Looks like this. If you didn't get one, they're on the table there in the foyer. We invite you to take one of those. And this uh, coin reminds us, I have one here, I carry it with me. I got it in my pocket, I hope you all carry yours with you too. And it reminds us that we're committed to this challenge, these challenges together. That we're going to be doing them together, not individually as lone wolves, but together as a church. If you didn't get a coin last week, as I said, they're on the main table in the foyer. We invite you to take one before you leave today. In every one of my... Uh, 30-day church challenge sermons, I'm issuing a weekly challenge related to the five purposes of the church. Two weeks ago, I shared with you about community. We looked at the importance of being a part of an authentic community of faith where you can personally experience love, encouragement, and support. We all need that in our life, don't we? Yes. We do. We looked at the importance of being an authentic community of faith. The weekly challenge was to commit to joining a community group. More than half of our church is already involved in a community group, and that's a great thing. Then last week we discussed that we're wired for worship. The Apostle Paul told us in Romans 12, 1, that worship is a verb, not a noun. It's something we do. It's an action we take with every breath that we breathe. Uh, we said that it touches all aspects of our lives, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week we should be about worship. And we challenge you for at least the next three weeks uh, to, take, uh, to come to church every single Sunday to be a part of the worship service experience. And then we also, part of the challenge was to take your ordinary life, as the Message Bible told us, our ordinary life, our sleeping life, our going to work life, our eating life, our walking around life, all of the ordinary things that we do in life, and instead of doing them with routine, to actually give them to God as an act of worship, to worship God with even our ordinary things that we do. So how are we doing so far? Good. Are we learning something? Good. Yes. All right. Remember, it's more than just checking something off on a list. It's about embracing the experience and engaging yourself in the five purposes of the church. When you do this, you're going to discover how to reach your God-given potential. And you'll experience the love, joy, peace, and fulfillment that comes from actually doing the will of God in your life. Today our challenge for this third Sunday is the, the third purpose of the church is spiritual growth. Our foundational passage for the 30-day church challenge, like I said, is found in the book of Acts. If you'll turn there with me to the book of Acts, it's page 967 in the Bibles there at your seats. Acts 2, 42. We'll read through 47. All of these challenges come from our first example of the very first church. And this is the first church ever. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
Before we go on with today's message, I want to give you a little preview, a little commercial, if I can, of the next series that we're going to be doing. Some of you were here for future history, and we covered the first five books, five chapters of the book of Daniel. Three weeks from now, we're going to continue the next three chapters in Daniel. Then we're going to break from that again and cover a little unexpected Christmas series. And then in January, we're going to finish up the book of Daniel. I'm excited about this series called Future History as we make our way through it. What I'm most excited about is what we'll cover is interesting lessons from Daniel. Uh, Daniel in the lion's den is J Daniel chapter 6. We've all heard that story, but we're going to get some secrets out of that that will help us look at some interesting facts about future prophecy and world events. Uh, how, to, how you will benefit from this next series is by uh, making sense of the world around us. We turn on the news and we see all kinds of junk happening all the time. This series will help you deal with life as it happens. So I, it's going to be a great teaching series and you're not going to want to miss that as we start that in a couple of weeks. Not enough commercial. So back to Acts chapter 2. Uh, the first church was committed to authentic community. Verse 44 says they had everything in common. They knew how to do life together. Uh, the first church enjoyed worship, as we talked about last week. Verse 47, they were praising God and, and enjoying the favor of all the people. But they had another important habit that they adopted. It's found in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Why did they do that? Very simply, they wanted to grow. They wanted to grow. Today we're going to talk about spiritual growth. Chances are when you were little, your parents had a special place. Maybe the inside of a door frame. Mine was on a wall in our kitchen. Maybe it's on the back door of a closet where every three or four months or so they measured your height. And do you remember how excited you were when you saw that you had grown? Even if it was a little bit, you saw a little bit of growth. Remember that day when you passed your mom's height? Oh, how exciting that was. And then maybe you passed your dad's height and how excited that, that was. You know, something in us just wants to grow. We get excited when we see it and when we feel it happening. Growth is such a part of who we are as humans. And did you know that the Bible measures our spiritual height? It measures our spiritual growth. In John chapter 1, 2, 1 John 2, 12, the apostle tells us, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. By the time John wrote this letter, he was in his 60s or 70s, and that doesn't seem all that old for us today. I, I was watching a news program this week, and uh, the, guy, the guy came on at the very end of the program and wished this lady in another part of the country a happy 107th birthday. 60 and 70 doesn't seem that old anymore. But back then, in the first century, John was an old man. He'd seen a lot. So he's writing this book as a grandfatherly figure to younger, younger people. And he continues on. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known Him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And get this, and the Word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. By John's definition, spiritual children are those who have received Jesus as their personal Savior. They've had their sins forgiven by knowing Christ and what His, His sacrifice on the cross did for them. They know God, K-N-O-W. They know Him as, a, as you know your best friend. Young Spiritual young men are strong because they regular, regularly are reading God's Word. They're involved in the cause of Christ. They're advancing the kingdom because, and they have overcome the evil one. Spiritual fathers are those who have a relationship with the Lord that's deep enough to know God's character personally, that He's eternal that he's existed from the beginning. That's how God measures spiritual growth. From just coming to Christ, to growing, to serving, to knowing God, just like you know a great friend, just like you know your best friend, 
you can know God in much the same way, in that personal, deep, intimate relationship. That's what we're all about here at South Bay Bible Church, is knowing God just like that. Life is all about growth, and spiritual life is all about spiritual growth. Have you ever noticed the minute we stop growing up, we normally start growing out. Have you ever noticed that? You've noticed that, haven't you? And then we deal with that problem, seems like, for the rest of our lives. Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. The Apostle Paul tells us, So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Trees grow until the day they die. And humans are supposed to grow until the day they die. Some of us die on the inside long before we die on the outside. And I want to give you three signs today that someone is dying on the inside. Three signs. They stop learning. They stop maturing. They stop caring. You can tell that a person has stopped learning because they never share anything new. They never share anything that they've read that's fresh. They never share anything they heard at a seminar. They never share anything they gleaned from a sermon. They never share a podcast. They never maybe share a community group conversation. They just seem to be getting stale. You can tell when a person has stopped maturing because their character hasn't changed. They're not becoming a more thoughtful person. They're not becoming more patient as a person. They don't do anything more helpful around the house, the neighborhood, work, or at church than they did a few years ago. You can tell when a person has stopped caring because they simply don't care anymore. They don't care anymore today about helping children that are starving around the world or about local injustice that they did a few years ago. Maybe they stopped giving to missions because they just don't care about spreading the gospel anymore around the world. These are people are growth stunted. And growth stuntedness happens, can happen to anyone. But God never intends for us to stop growing. If you stop growing, that is not God's will for you as a person. Life is all about growing. All about growing. Birds grow. Bees grow. Plants grow. Trees grow. Viruses, germs, microorganisms, and fungi grow. Everything that's living is supposed to be growing. Over the past few years, most of us have learned that we got to grow just to stay up with where we're at. We've got to keep building muscle. Not to grow more muscle, but just to stay where we're at. Because those who aren't growing in their job skills, those aren't growing in their life, what usually happens to them at work? They usually get laid off, don't they? They usually get let go. Every computer application you own, whether you have a Mac, whether you have a PC, whether you have a, a smartphone or, or some type of tablet, those applications, those programs, they get updated at least once a year, sometimes once a month, sometimes if you look at your history and your updates, they're updated like every few days, some of those applications. New features are coming online, and you risk falling behind if you don't learn those new features. Some people struggle to use Facebook and smartphones, texting and tablet computer applications because they just didn't grow up with them. And when they came out, they didn't realize that they would have to learn all of this just to keep up with the culture that they live in. I remember knowing the earliest versions of Word. And then Word 2007 came out. It was completely different. I'm like, I don't want to learn the new one. And I didn't for a while. But then I learned I had to just to keep up. Life is about growing. And you have to grow just to keep up but for no other reason. You and I ought to be getting better until the day we die. Last week we talked about Romans 12, 1, where Paul says, Based on all the incredible things God has done for you, present your bodies, your whole selves, to Him, to God, as a living sacrifice. That's your true and proper worship. Then interestingly enough, 
The very next verse tells us in Romans 12, 2, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Life is about growing. Growing is about transformation. It's about moving from something you're not to something you should be. If you're following along in the sermon notes in your bulletin, we're right here. Growth, growing is about transformation. Number two. So what is it we should be when we're all grown up? Well, first of all, we're never going to be all grown up. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 8.29 that we're supposed to be conformed into the image of God's Son, Jesus. Conformed. In Romans 12, he says that we're supposed to be transformed. To be transformed is to have our form changed, our spiritual life changed. Trans means change. To be conformed is to have our form changed with another. Con means with. Our goal for our, the goal for our growth is to be changed, to conform to the likeness of Jesus, to be conformed, to be more like Christ. Think like Christ, to act like Jesus. What was Jesus like? Jesus was a man on a mission. Jesus thought like one sent from God. Jesus acted like the servant of all. That's what we're supposed to be growing toward. When you grow as a football player, you learn to run better. You learn to tackle better. You learn to read the defenses better. When you grow as a Christian, you learn to believe better. You want your faith to grow. You want to hope better than you did yesterday. You want to love better, as we went through in our last series on Christian. As you are transformed by the renewing of your mind, you believe less of what Oprah says and more of what God says in His Word. You become less of a taker and more of a giver. Your life becomes less about you and more about other people. That's the whole point of the spiritual life. But listen, none of this happens overnight. It's a process. It's an ongoing process. That's why Paul says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not renewed as in period, you can arrive and it's done, but by renewing. Not a one-time thing, but an all-the-time thing. By what you put into your mind, the good stuff, what you see, what you read, what you hear, what you talk about. Be transformed by the ongoing renewal of your mind. Now I want you to nudge your neighbor. Go ahead. Kathy, you can do it. Nudge your neighbor and say, you need to be renewed. Say it. Come on. Now nudge your neighbor again. And say, I do too. I do too. <laughs> we all need to be renewed, don't we? We all need to be renewed. You and I need to be renewed. Renewed. And again renewed. And renewed again. Renewing is a process that happens one step at a time. The more steps you take, the more progress you make. Your goal is to step up to spiritual growth by, by committing to one spiritual step at a time. It all starts with renewing your mind. Throughout history, Christians have discovered certain habits that if practiced repeatedly over time, lead to spiritual transformation. We learned last week that the, one of the fundamental habits, we got a few that we want to talk about, one of those fundamental habits is weekly worship. Coming to church every week, it tends to reset your mental and spiritual clock by reminding you of what's really important, by reminding you of what is true. Our mind gets bombarded all week with untruths and, and stuff that doesn't match up. But God uses this time at church to, to do a reboot. Is that a good technological word? A reboot, a <laughs> systems check, a reprogramming of us on Sunday. Then a, small, a second most fundamental step is daily Bible reading. The book, the Bible, contains pure truth. It's not like Sports Illustrated or Cosmopolitan Magazine, as wonderful as they might be. They contain some truth, 
but then they contain some distortions of the truth. This book is all true. Everything it says about God is true. Everything it says about life is true. And get this one. Everything it says about you is true. Everything. When you read this book, it helps you think more accurately. It helps you see the world more precisely. And, it, it, and understand God's will more clearly. When you're, the more accurate, the more precise, and the more clear your thinking is, the more mature you will become spiritually. And that's a good thing. There are many more steps to take as you mature. Prayer helps to renew your mind on a daily basis. So does being in a community group and sharing with an authentic community of believers. Sharing your faith forces you to renew your mind because you have to be clear about what's true when you're talking to someone else about your faith. All of these practices are part of our 30-day church challenge. By the end of this, you're all going to be practicing habits that's going to make you a spiritual giant. That's what's so great about this series. Your challenge this week is simply to grow. Your 30-day church challenge book will give you small, simple steps to take every single day this week. But the major weekly challenge that I want you to be on this week, that I want you to take starting today, when you get home, is to commit to spending some time with God every single day. There's two parts to that. The first part of that is spending time with God reading His Bible, reading the Bible. The second part of that is spending time with God in prayer every day. God speaks to you while you read His Word. It's a letter written to you. And when you pray, you're speaking to God. Now here are some, here, here's, here, I'm going to give you two options this morning. Option number one. If you're new to reading the Bible, you're here checking out this Jesus thing. You're not even sure if you're ready to sign in yet or, or, or be a part of it. But you're just checking it out. We're so glad you're here. You couldn't have picked a better series to be a part of. We're glad you're part of it. So here's the challenge for you. If you're new, maybe you read a little bit or you did the, 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 the open and point method or whatever and you haven't read much systematically, I'm going to challenge you today. I want you to commit to reading the Bible for at least five minutes a day for the next 21 days. Now I'm a math guy. So I want to tell you how much time that is. Every single person that wake, gets a fresh wake up in the morning, right? You're, luck, you're, you're, you're blessed if you woke up this morning, right? You get 1,440 minutes a day, just like everybody else does. If you spend five minutes reading God's Word, get this, you're reading less than 1% of your day. That's actually 0.5% of your day. A half of 1% of your day will be will be in Bible reading. Anybody can fit that into your schedule, right? Say yes. yes. Anybody can fit that in, right? That's like nothing. All right? So for the next 21 days, your commitment, all I'm asking you to do, if you haven't been a Bible reader, is just spend that half a 1%, five minutes a day, reading the Bible. And if you, in, in, uh, then spend two minutes a day with God in prayer. Your prayers don't have to be elaborate. They don't have to use a different language. You don't have to know King James language and say, Oh, doest thou as most highest God. None of that stuff. God's not interested in a different language. He, do, he knows you. He knows you better than you know you. And He just wants to have a conversation with you. So you just pray. Just like I'm talking to you. Just like you're talking to me or a friend. You just sit there and have a conversation with God. If you've never read the whole Bible before, that's okay. This is a great way to start. I encourage you to start with the book of Luke. That's the third book in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Start with Luke. And then uh, it'll give you just about all the stories, the major stories of Jesus in the Bible. And you start with Luke and you just keep reading through the end of the, the, the New Testament. All right, all the way through Revelation. Five minutes a day. You won't get through the whole thing in 21 days, but that's okay. You'll get there. Probably this year, if you just keep reading five minutes a day, you'll be amazed at how far you get, how quickly. So commit to doing it for the next 21 days. Are you up for this challenge? Say yes. 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 Good. 
Now, when you start an exercise program, you don't go to the gym and lift weights for two solid hours, do you? No, why? Because you probably would be so sore the second day you would never return again. At least I would. That's how sore I would be. So don't start with two hours of Bible reading. You're not going to be able to keep that up. You're just not going to be able to maintain that. So we're just asking for seven minutes a day. Five Bible reading. Uh, when you come to a text, something in the, in the Word of God that strikes you, say, man, I really like that. I'd like that to be a part of my life. You can interrupt your Bible reading. It's okay. You can, you can split it up and pray right in the middle of your two minutes and say, God, I would like to have that quality in my life. I would like to be able to love my neighbor more. I would like whatever he's speaking. That's a prayer he's going to answer. It's right in his word. And he's going to honor that. He's going to help you with that. When you come to a place that causes you to think about something really deeply, you might want to mark that in the Bible. It's okay to write in your Bible, underline something, or get a highlighter and highlight it. And maybe you want to say, God, help me apply that to my life. That's okay. Do that. If you, if you are already in the habit of reading your Bible, you read every day, five minutes, six minutes, whatever, your assignment is to go a little bit deeper. Here's option two. You're not to read for five minutes a day. Go for 10 minutes a day, a whole one whopping 1% 1 of your day, right? You can do it. With five minutes of prayer instead of two minutes, just talk a little bit longer with God. Uh, when you finish reading, I want to challenge you, if you want to go a little bit deeper, to write down one sentence from that day's reading that describes what you read that day. Just one sentence. This is called meditating. Another word for that is thinking deeper about the subject. Writing down the point of the message forces your mind to go just a little bit deeper. And while you're writing that down, you can say, Lord, help me apply this to my life so that I can grow to be a little bit more like Jesus. That's easy, isn't it? You up for the challenge? Yes. Say yes. Good, good. I'll prompt you when you should say yes. <laughs> One more principle. As we're growing, what is the purpose of growth? Why is it so important that we grow and not stagnate? The purpose of all growth is reproduction. That's the point. John says that the highest form of spirituality is to be a spiritual father. We could say spiritual father or mother. You can't be a spiritual father unless you have spiritual children. Just not possible. A mature tree produces seeds that make mature trees. A mature rabbit produces more rabbits. A mature banana slug produces more banana slugs. The Apostle John, in John chapter 15, reports that Jesus said this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, he can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples." We were born to reproduce. Jesus calls it bearing fruit. And he says the only fruit we can bear if we is if we remain in him. This means that we spend time with him reading his word. That's written to us, the Bible. Listening to him by reading his word. And then talking to him through prayer. That helps us bear fruit. God gets the glory when we bear fruit. Jesus is the ultimate fruit bearer. And every one of us belongs to Him as His fruit. And then, with, we belong to Him with the other two billion Christians on earth that are part of His fruit. Fruit that came from Him invited someone else to come to Him. And then that piece of fruit matured and grew and had seed and sowed seed and, and, and invited others to come to Him. And they accepted that invitation. And still others came as a result of that until someone someday looked at you and invited you to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. We'll talk more about that 
in a few weeks. But that's what it means to be a mature, follow, growing follower of Jesus Christ. To actually bear spiritual fruit. Now, picture this in your mind for just a moment. Imagine you're overweight. That's easier for some of us to imagine than others. But if you're really skinny still, I want you to imagine that you've just put on a bunch of weight. Alright? You're feeling flabby. You're always out of breath. You can't even walk up stairs without having some oxygen. You know, that, that sick feeling. Most of us have probably felt that way sometime in our life, right? Now picture the opposite of that. Picture yourself as trim and buff. You have ripping biceps. Instead of having one ab like I do, you have a whole six-pack of them. You have a bunch of abs. And you can run a 5K or a 10K without any effort at all. No, no even fast breathing. You're in shape. Everybody admires your physique. You're a handsome devil, right? Now, which feels better? Flabby or fit? Fit or flabby? Which feels better? Fit. Fit does, right? Now, transfer that to the spiritual realm. Imagine yourself as not caring much about God or other people. You're kind of self-centered, lazy, don't value the truth, keeping your word or helping others. Doesn't feel very good, does it? Now flip that picture. Flip that picture and imagine yourself as a spiritual giant. You are trustworthy and others-centered. You you, people admire you for your character because you always tell the truth. You're patient with children. Your self-control. You actually enjoy helping others and helping others grow in their own walk with Jesus. Now, which feels better? Spiritually flabby or fit? Fit or flabby? Fit. Fit, right? We want to be spiritually fit. You can become that person. You can do it. To get there, you have to take one step at a time and then another and still another. One step at a time. You really can grow to be like Jesus. To be that way, you need to think that way. Transfer, transforming our thinking. Renewing our mind. That's why Paul says that. So read God's thoughts. Spend 5 or 10 minutes or 15, whatever you can do in God's Word every day. Letting Him talk to you as well as taking time to talk to Him. Combine that with our other challenges we're taking during this 30-day church challenge. And you'll be on the road to spiritual biceps that'll be ripped and spiritual six-pack abs that'll be fun to have, right? You get me? Now turn to your neighbor, nudge him again and say, you can be a spiritual stud. Come on. Say that. Good job. If you don't have a 30-day church challenge book, we're having a little fun today, right? If you don't have your 30-day church challenge book, I want to encourage you to take one. They're free of charge. You get them, pick them up right on the outside, the main table in the lobby in the foyer there. Pick one up, take it home. There's a little daily devotional, a passage of Scripture. You can start there, read that, and, and, uh, and, and, and pick that up and get started on it. And if you're not in a community group, what should you do? Join one. You should join one. Get in a community group. You will be extraordinarily blessed in your spiritual life as you take part in a community group. Let's pray. God, we love you. We praise you. You are our God and we are your people. And we are so grateful to be in the house of God today. And Lord, we don't want to remain spiritual weaklings. We want to grow up, have strong spiritual muscles. We want to grow up in Christ and be like Jesus with a transformation of our mind and our thinking. We want to, we want to have a reboot. We want to have a, a, a Martin 2.0. We, we want to continue to grow and be like Christ. And Lord, that happens mostly through coming to church, as we said last week, but also, Lord, through reading your word, by reading your word and getting in our daily life. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us, if we've never read the Bible before, to start reading it just five minutes a day. And, God, I pray in Jesus' name that we would begin that habit of reading your Bible daily and praying daily, meditating on it, if we want to go to the next step, and just taking one of these steps every single day. Help us grow up in Christ, that we may reproduce 
and bear much fruit for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we said, we believe that the spiritual life...